Good evening to everyone. Thank you for being here. It's wonderful to see you all. Uh, I, my name is J.B. Hawes, and I am the new director at the Neely Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship. And it's my distinct pleasure to welcome you here for our Lara F. Willis Book of Mormon lecture. We're so honored to have Professor Richard Bushman here to deliver our lecture. And we're grateful that Professor Bushman has joined us. We're especially grateful to have two Professors Bushman here. We're grateful that Claudia is here as well. And uh, I want to put in a plug for this. Claudia's memoir, her autobiography, has just been published, I, Claudia. So check it out. Uh, join me in celebrating that with Claudia. I think that's wonderful. If you know anything about the Bushmans, you know that they are a team. And uh, so we are so glad to have both of them here. This is wonderful. Um, I also uh, am very, very pleased to announce that we have with us uh, Mark and Lara Willis, who are benefactors for this lecture series. And we're so grateful for their support of the Maxwell Institute. Please join me in thanking them for their support of this lecture. And uh, one last uh, bit of thanks. So many of you are here because of all of the things that have been happening at the Maxwell Institute over the years. And as I am new in my position, I, I feel so much of the, the energy and the enthusiasm for Maxwell Institute activities is due to my predecessor, Spencer Fluman. Spencer and Holly are here. It is our first public chance to thank them for his years of leadership. Thank you, Spencer. We're pleased to announce that tonight is the, the first of a, a, a really robust lecture series that we are having this semester. And so we want all of you to know about this. We'll be passing out flyers that you can take with you. Uh, we are this semester focusing on the wonder of scripture. This lecture series will take place on Fridays at 11 here on campus in room 3714 in the library. That's the, the auditorium on the south and just inside the south doors of the Harold B. Lee Library. We have our kickoff lecture tomorrow with Tom Griffith, uh, who will be also talking about the gold plates. We are so excited to have this two-day gold plate commemorative event uh, that Professor Bushman is starting us tonight and then Tom Griffith tomorrow. So please look to join us Fridays at 11 for our lecture series, The Wonder of Scripture. We uh, will now have an opening prayer for the evening from Lara Willis. We're so grateful for Sister Willis being here. And then following the opening prayer, our academic vice president, Justin Collings, will introduce Richard, and then we'll have the Gold Plates Lecture by Richard Bushman. Good evening. It's wonderful to see such a such a great crowd. Although it's a, it's not a surprise given the the name that's on the billing uh, tonight. I want to begin by expressing gratitude for the the Maxwell Institute and its uh, its past and current leadership. I'm told that when the Maxwell Institute was founded in 2006, my predecessor John Tanner told those assembled that the name of Elder Neil A. Maxwell was the most precious resource that the Maxwell Institute had, and that it was, uh, it was given to them in, in sacred trust. And I'm grateful uh, for, for those who've kept alive Elder Maxwell's name and, and his legacy. I, I love the, the title of this uh, series, The Wonder of, of Scripture, because it uh, captures uh, Elder Maxwell's buoyant, zestful, uh, jubilant approach to what he called the, the inexhaustible gospel. Uh, Elder Maxwell said in 1996 on this campus, said, no wonder given its intellectual expansiveness, we are still inventorying the harvest basket of the restoration. Having dashed about the wonder-filled landscape of the Restoration, exclaiming and observing, it should not surprise us if some of our first impressions prove to be more childish than definitive. Brushing against such tall timber, the scent of pine is inevitably upon us. Our pockets are filled with souvenir cones and colorful rocks, and we are filled with childish glee. There is no way to grasp it all. Little wonder some of us mistake a particular tree for the whole of the forest. Or then in our explanation, exclamations, there are some unintended exaggerations. We have seen far too much to describe. Indeed, we cannot say the smallest part which we feel. 
I can't think of anybody better to kick off this Wonder of Scripture series than Richard Bushman, who has contributed magnificently uh, across many decades to what Elder Maxwell calls inventorying the harvest basket of the restoration. Uh, the awkward thing about introducing Richard Bushman is that in his case, the old cliche is actually true. He needs no introduction. Uh, everybody knows who Richard Bushman is. Um, but I feel it uh, incumbent upon me as a BYU administrator to, to know that um, we try hard to articulate what the mission and the dream and the vision of, of BYU is. And... Uh, Although he's spent much of most of his career away from BYU, uh, Richard has done us the uh, incomparable service of showing us exactly what that mission looks like, that combination of exacting scholarly inquiry and unwavering religious faith. To invoke another cliche, Richard is a gentleman and a scholar. Uh, as a scholar, uh, he is a truly distinguished historian of uh, colonial and early national New England. Uh, very early in his career, he was awarded the Bancroft Prize, which is the probably the most distinguished uh, and prestigious award that can be given to an American historian. And he's had another career as uh, maybe the most distinguished uh, historian of, of Latter-day Saint history that we've, we've ever had. Uh, but emblematic of that is the publication of his 2005 uh, biography of the Prophet Joseph Smith, Rough, Rough Stone Rolling. He's also been a patron of the arts. Um, he truly is a gentleman, but uh, in saying that, um, his, uh, his gentlemanly qualities are really a product of his discipleship. Our BYU mission statement says that to succeed in our mission, we, we must cultivate an environment enlightened by living prophets and sustained by those moral virtues which characterize the life and teachings of the Son of God. And Richard, for me, has always been uh, one who embodies Christ-like virtues. When I think of him, I think of words like decency, kindness, courage, meekness, loyalty, generosity, nobility of spirit, and wisdom. His wisdom has been manifest for many of us who have been blessed to be taught by him and mentored by him. And for the sake of any students here, I want to share three personal mentoring moments. Um, I'm probably the least of those who've been uh, taught and mentored by by Richard, but these were these were meaningful to me, and I'll I'll share them for the, the sake of students here. Uh, two are brief; one's a little longer. Um, I once heard him say that many people's approach to scholarship is to survey the literature of the field. Um, looking for a, a tiny chink in the fence and then to plug that chink. And as I remember, he said, I really dislike that approach. He might've even said, I hate that approach. Um, ask the questions that matter to you and the originality will come out in your response to those questions and the way that you engage with those questions. On another occasion, I, uh, was in law school and uh, wondering whether I really liked law school and could could make it and uh, talked about finding an, an exit route and had counseled with him a little bit about that and but decided ultimately to, to stay and to focus on law school. And he said, sent me an email. He said, sounds like a judicious decision and in the best interests of the family, you will find that you can work your way back toward your interests by many paths. And that uh, was not only wise, but prophetic, that a, a somewhat circuitous uh, route, I was able to, to do a lot, of, a lot of the things that love me and I'm, and I'm still able to, <clears throat> that I love and still able to do that. Now, this last one, um, uh, part of the way through law school, I decided I was going to apply to do a PhD in history. And uh, that took some hooks by. I had not been an undergraduate major in history. And Richard Bushman was really the only living, breathing, card-carrying historian whom I, I knew. So I reached out to him for some uh, assistance. And I wrote uh, a, a personal statement to support my history app, PhD application. And my impression from having done this for law school was that he needed to write something that was kind of swashbuckling and charming with a bit of bravado and panache. And I, I wrote something in this spirit. 
And I was kind of taken with it. And I, I emailed it to Richard Bushman and Terrell Givens. And then I kind of sat back and waited uh, for them to write back a, a response filled with praise and admiration. And uh, <clears throat> this is what I got in response uh, to draft one from, from Richard Bushman. Dear Justin, if I were you, I would scrap this statement. Gets better. And start over in a more sober mood. Your romantic spirit, and you put quotes around that, which makes me fear that I actually used that phrase uh, in the first. Your romantic spirit got the better of you on this round. Buy a copy of the New Yorker or the New York Review of Books, read either one for an hour, and then begin again. Committees will pretty much discount your epiphanies and unfettered abandonment to history. They will want evidence of intellectual penetration. Um, now, you can imagine a, a very inflated balloon deflating uh, slowly into a, a kind of rumpled rubber rag uh, on the ground. But, but is, 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 uh, th that stung a little bit, but my overwhelming feeling then and later was one of gratitude, that I had a mentor who could, could speak candidly and plainly in a way that would help me. Uh, and help me move forward. I, I took that to heart, worked hard on a revision uh, and sent it to Richard. And I, I kind of went back in the archives today uh, trying to be a good historian, and, but I pulled this up. And his response to draft two was this, dear Justin, much, much, much better. I got three of them. In fact, I think excellent. You've hit it on the head this time. You were consumed with the problem rather than yourself. Um, that, uh, that short commendation meant as much to me as any, any commendation I've ever had because I knew, uh, based on what had preceded it, that it was honest and that, uh, that maybe I'd earned uh, at least some of it. But I want to close, close with that line, you're consumed with the problem rather than yourself, because for me, Richard Bushman is the embodiment of someone who throughout his life has been consumed with the problem uh, rather than himself. And the problem fundamentally is the problem that we try to approach as an institution, which is how can we be truly invested? Uh, how can we seek excellence in the life of the mind and the pursuit of goodness, beauty, and truth while remaining unequivocally loyal to the restored gospel of Jesus Christ? Uh, and not only has, been, has Richard been consumed with that problem rather than himself, uh, he offers us a living, breathing, um, wonderful uh, embodiment of what the solution to that problem looks like. So I hope you'll join me in welcoming Dr. Richard Bushman. Sounds, Justin, like you're in a position to deliver wise advice on your own now. So thanks. That's a very complimentary introduction. And thanks so much for coming. It's great to see you all, this sea of faces out here. I taught at BYU many years ago. And it's a, it's a lovely thing for a Latter-day Saint scholar to teach in a Latter-day Saint university where you can bring your whole mind into play, all your faith, and your beliefs can interact with whatever is being taught. So consider yourself very privileged to, to be here. And I'm sure if you seek the Lord's best blessing, he'll help you to do well and find your, your place in the world. I want to say I'm very complimented and honored and pleased to be invited to give this inaugural lecture, especially under the name of Laura Willis. Um, the Willis's moved to Los Angeles just about the time Claudia and I started a stint down there teaching at the Claremont uh, Graduate University. And so we uh, got to know them a little bit. I always felt a kinship to um, Mark because I teach at Columbia, or I did teach at Columbia, and Mark went, had two degrees in Columbia. But uh, what we really remember is a answer of Laura's to uh, one of Claudia's questions and moved to town or bought a new house. They needed a place large enough 
to house the families of their five children. And that's quite a job. And uh, Claudia, my wife, observed that uh, bedding all the children down was one thing, but what about feeding them three times a day? He says, that's easy, says Laura. At meal times, we just ask the food truck to pull up in front of the house. It's a good solution. Keep it in mind. They, uh, the Willises were really far-ranging in their outlook on the church and interested also in the scholarly side of Latter-day Saints. So I was delighted, uh, but not surprised, when I heard years ago of their grant to Brigham Young University to sponsor scholarship on the Book of Mormon, which both of them love and, and admire. Tonight, I'm going to share a few thoughts with you about the plates of the Book of Mormon. I will confess that I feel about my recent book on Joseph Smith's gold plates the way I felt about my biography of Joseph Smith himself. The subject is bigger than anything I put in the book. There is something deeper, more compelling, perhaps more mysterious than appeared on the pages of that book. But I keep on trying to get deeper into both subjects, even after the book is in print. So, uh, yeah. what are we to make of the gold plates? Today I will address the question of their meaning now. How do they function in our faith today? We all know they're among the most exotic of our beliefs. There's nothing quite like them in religious history, and they were a bizarre item to appear in 19th century rural culture. Where were their plates, gold plates with a history on them? How do we feel about them now after two centuries have gone by? Mm. We're going the wrong way. How about that? Okay. To help us along, I'm going to draw on the comments of a... I'm in trouble with this machine. Here we go. Uh, on the comments of a small group of Latter-day Saints scholars, I consulted while writing the Gold Plates book. I asked 20 scholarly Latter-day Saint friends to write a couple of paragraphs on what the plates mean to them. All of the replies were intriguing and eloquent and as a whole quite varied. I'm sorry to say that the Oxford editor, Oxford was a publisher, was not taken with the idea and the statements never made it into the book. But tonight I want to give you a brief glance what my friends had to say. The most significant result of this modest poll is that the plates still have a place in Mormon thought. Only one respondent objected to the materiality of the plates. All the others accepted their reality. As one exception, John Peters, a scholar of media, acknowledged the significance of Joseph Smith's claim they were, he said, a bold stroke against the flow of religious thought in his time. He observed, I'm going to read you what's on the on the screen so you can uh, follow me along and check, check out what I'm saying. And I'm underscoring the parts I'm going to read, but I'm going to put some things up there that I won't read so you can cast your eyes around and see if you see anything more of interest. They were a bold stroke against the religious thought of his time. The plates, here I'm starting on, on uh, Peters, tied Joseph Smith's revelations and claims to authority to material objects in time and space. They cut wonderfully against the grain of other religious thinkers in his time, eager to consign ritual and history to the realm of metaphor. Smith's contemporary, Ralph Waldo Emerson, for instance, 
resigned as a Unitarian minister in 1832 because he could not, in good conscience, administer the Lord's Supper. He found it a historical anachronism and a painful impediment. He wanted a faith free of what he thought was misplaced concreteness. The plates, in contrast, as John Peter says, seem to stake a claim in tangible reality and have a rather literal thingliness. There's a long history since Moroni retrieved them of thinking about the plates as things among things, like billiard balls, stones, and trees. Peters admires Joseph Smith's Bravura in claiming to have gold plates, but he takes issue with this thingliness, not because he thinks the plates are obvious fantasies, the objection most would raise, but for aesthetic reasons. Here's what he says. The fraud or fidelity way of thinking about gold plates has always felt to me like a painful impediment. There are more edifying and less brittle ways of thinking about faith contingent objects. He th that Peter thinks the plates are more elusive than that. Here he says, the witnesses describe them as sacred, if bulky objects that materialized and vanished at the command of angels. The ability to see them dependent on the viewer's righteousness, not the natural eyes. He thinks the plates were more grounded than metaphors, but less leaden than profane objects. That's what I mean by an aesthetic objection to plates that were as solid as billiard balls. Seeing them as things makes them leaden. He is seeking for something more elusive and evocative than a heavy stack of metal sheets. Peters was the only contributor to finesse the question of the plate's material existence. All the others held on to the plate's physicality. They felt the plate just went with being a Latter-day Saint. Philip Barlow, a scholar at the Maxwell Institute, Observe that my people are given to wonders, importance, and intrinsic to the stories of their origins, angels and revelations, seers and seer stones, healings and gifts of the spirit. The gold plates are but one among these other worldly strains. That's so Arlen was saying, is what it means to be a Latter day Saint. You believe in marvels. Barlow was not tempted to bracket the plates or other tokens of the supernatural for, from the story. They came as a parcel. The plates flow together with other miraculous encounters in Latter-day Saint history. My sister, Cher Cherry Silver, wrote that on a very few occasions, I have experienced connections with loved ones beyond this mortal life. With this evidence of the divine, it is only a step more to accept that an infinite being could choose to use ancient writings on gold plates as a way to bring forth light and understanding to his children. The writer Glenn Nelson was composed an operatic libretto about the gold plates. Put it another way, for me and for the people I imagine experiencing these works, we are so confident in the story that we are comfortable teasing out humor, theater, and art from it. They're just part of the world as we understand it. Barlow, Silver, and Nelson live in two worlds, the world of modern rationalism and the world of belief, a division most everyone here likely understands, a world of rationalism and, in contrast, a world of belief. Like the three of them, most Latter-day Saints are committed to a world of wondrous happenings overlaying the world common sense rationalism. We have made a choice to live in both worlds and are happy with this decision. Acceptance did, always, did not always imply intricate engagement with the plates. The historian Jed Woodworth said that each day he walks by a sculpture of the witnesses viewing the plates in a bas-relief on the wall of the Church History Library in Salt Lake City. 
he pays them little heed, even though believing implicitly in the reality. Here he says, I'm not inclined to pass off the plates as mere metaphor, as other Christians have done with their secret stories. I accept God's intervention in human affairs, and the plates as an actual physical artifact, just as Joseph Smith and the witnesses described. But as I pass these panels each from day to day, I don't agonize over them, just as um, the depictions do not call forth my resistance. On the other hand, the events in the depicted in the panels do not overawe me either. Despite the unavoidable presence of the plates in my life, they are a distant presence for me, a relic from the past. God had work to do, and he did it through the plates. God's work today calls forth different methods and means. The philosopher James Faulkner felt much the same. The truth is that I don't think about the plates very much. I suppose that in their, their regard, I'm a naive believer. Part of my experience of conversion was the acceptance of the reality. I'm interested in the revealed text more than in the physical object to which it is somehow or another correlated or in that correlation itself. I take the existence of the plates as a given, but not one that draws my attention. For these two, Woodworth and Faulkner, belief was implicit in their faith, but the plates don't long, no longer matter much. Later in this paper, I will challenge this attitude, but I think it is likely that most Latter-day Saints feel the same way. We simply have no reason to think much about the plates. We don't defend them. We don't speculate about them. They're on deposit somewhere in our memories, and that is about all. I would say that all the respondents were aware that the plates are an affront to common sense and ordinary reason, but the writers were perfectly content with that. The historian Kathleen Flake saw the plates as an antidote for any inclination to make our religion seem perfectly rational. Too many miracles come along in the story. I'm mostly amused, he wrote, by how effectively the gold plates challenge efforts, academic or otherwise, to rationalize Mormonism. As I said before, most of us live in two worlds, a rational, common sense world on the one hand, and a marvelous world of miracles and gold plates on the other. The Maxwell theologian Kim Matheson found the demand for a degree of credulity bracing. Mormonism's gold plates serve as a religious embarrassment, embarrassment of the very best kind, she wrote. They are a kind of thing that force my devotions into tangibility, that root me to the material comments, commitments of my faith tradition and that prevent me from escaping into more respectable, spiritualized abstractions. Matheson doesn't mind that the plates seem out of place in modern thinking. She even thinks that the plates are purposely provocative. She compares the plates to the resurrection. Here she says, I think of the gold plates the way I think of the body of Jesus, a tangible and suspiciously absent, whose logic, crazy and yet, laughable, but still performs the very structure and faith. In other words, the embarrassments of the plates is in some ways briskly beneficial. They require us to exercise faith. The plates and Jesus' return from the tomb both run against common sense and disrupt our complacent acceptance of the ordinary. The cultural historian Terrell Givens argues that this demand is on purpose, perhaps even essential. It would seem that the brute physicality of the plates, their brazen resistance to allegorizing or spiritualizing, has to be the point. It would have been so much more prudent, so much safer, for Smith to claim the Book of Mormon derived from a personal revelation or spirit-led automatic writing, or, as with Doctrine and Covenants 7, a transcription of a visionary artifact. 
why articulate instead the most testable, the most implausible, the most seemingly disprovable of claims? Actual plates of gold, written by ancient Israelites and hidden in an upstate New York hillside. The artifactual concreteness of this origin story seems as deliberate, essential parallel to the res resurrection of Christ himself as a scandal of Christianity, in Emil Brumar's words. The resurrection was an assertion that went as far as possible against the universality of Christianity's claims. It was a barrier threshold that one could not pass without sacrificing the tenacious hold of one's inherited cultural and rational suppositions. Both accounts, early Christianist and Restorationist, defied casual belief or painless discipleship. The fantastic nature of the plates, Givens is saying, is meant to disrupt our assumptions and require a sacrifice of us. We must endure the shame of belief at odds with today's common sense. In one form or another, others asked about the plates providing access to another world. Are they designed to give us a glimpse of something marvelous and magnificent? Philip Barlow, whom I mentioned a few moments ago, wondered, might Joseph Smith's visions provide a glimpse of realities that operate on principles beyond what we detect in everyday life, which are five humble senses, like wormholes that warp time and space, or like the bizarre quantum laws governing entangled particles that are light years apart. Judge Tom Griffith, who's speaking tomorrow, uh, felt the plates were all the more challenging because there was a substantial evidence that they actually existed. As with the first Christians, eyewitnesses claim that this modern miracle is a historical reality. Those gold plates were seen, touched, hefted, and examined by many who then believed that history had once again been invaded by God and Christ in a way that changed everything. And while we know little about the ancient New Testament witnesses, we know much about the more recent eyewitnesses to the gold plates who left um, abundant records of their lives. That made them all the more challenging. Griffith says that the gold plates brought the skeptic to allow for the possibility that reality includes God and Christ and angels and moral laws that shape and mold us into different types of being that we might otherwise be, and that God and Christ has undertaken a major project for all the world in our times. Plates lead us to a God who points us to a higher life. The plates as a prod turn up in other statements. The historian Matt Bowman wrote that the plates may lead us to question our most basic cultural assumption, the dominance of science. Bowman suggests that science may not be as secure in its foundations as we think. The plates, and here I quote him, may be relevant even beyond believers in Joseph Smith's revelations because they remind the world that our scientism our empiricism, our rationality, is only one way human beings have sought to engage the world. And however useful it has been, it remains the product of history and therefore subject to its own limitations and fragility. I identify with the confidence of these writers who are miles away from having made the case that science is fragile and other worlds possible. But these writers sense the potential. They know what they're up against in questioning the prevailing orthodoxy. But given the fact that there is a respectable body of evidence that the witnesses actually saw and held the plates, they challenge rationalists to think twice about the supernatural world. Another category of respondents we're less preoccupied with a rationalist challenge than in asking what we learn from the plates about God's care for his children. 
These contributors interpreted the plate story as they would a parable. The plates remind me, as it said historian Kate Holbrook, of how generations of mortals, writers, collectors, editors, and translators, were asked to do more than they were capable of and agreed to try anyway. They worked without any promise that God would protect their sincere efforts from derision. They worked, in fact, knowing that those who found worth in their words would experience ridicule for that belief. These gallant souls never believed God would make a masterpiece of their contributions, only that he would augment their contributions just enough to fulfill his purposes. Similarly, Margaret Hemings, recent editor of Exponent 2, valued the plates for conveying hundreds of human stories. The Book of Mormon plates bore a record less of God's words than his people's struggles. The text is overall much more a narrative about people than a sermon from God. It is a record of individuals and societies struggling internally and with one another. A huge portion of the Book of Mormon concerns itself with human endeavors, corruption, violence, slavery, systems of government, and establishing churches. The stories of people with all their failings and foibles and mistakes and successes are sacred. The very existence of the Book of Mormon, a book of records, a book of stories that is so important and is written on a golden place for preservation, signals God's regard for human narratives. All of these, I think, are warm-hearted responses to the Book of Mormon from observers who look with compassion and understanding. J.B. Hawes, you all know J.P. Hawes, church historian added, humans created them and God imputed them, the plates, with power to transmit his grace in the form of a message that can transform the reader. The plate's survival and sheer existence witnessed that God had acknowledged their existence, had preserved them, had endorsed them, had blessed them. This really is the story of God's way of dealing with all humanity. The plates show him using history, human history, to reveal himself, God, and his purposes. Alone among the contributors, the literary scholar Rosalind Welch took off in another introduction entirely, one that particularly interested me. She addressed the mystery of translation. How are prophets called inspired to speak divine truth via oracular objects like the plates or the seer stones? Many of you are aware of the puzzle we now have concerning the plate's role in translation. What was their purpose when much of the time they lay covered on a table under a cloth? Was anything on the plates getting through to Joseph Smith when he did not even look at them? How does the Ehrman Thummim or the seer stone bridge this gap? Welch finds clues in the Book of Mormon itself. The paradigm for this account of prophecy is the episode of Lehi's discovery of the brass ball in his tent fort door in New 1 Nephi 16. In this theologically and typologically charged scene, the two figures, prophet and or oracular object, seem to call to one another in their sacred roles. Let me say that again. The two figures, prophet and oracular object, meaning the brass ball, seem to call one another, into their sacred roles. Each is necessary for the full realization of the other's powers. The object mediates the prophet's mantic authority while the prophet's gaze accesses the object's oracular power. A similar account of imminent prophetic authority is seen in the Book of Mormon, Prophet Mosiah and his interpreter stones, the Jaredite seer, in his illuminated stones, and arguably in Nephi and the sword of Laban. These episodes, it seems to me, may illuminate the phenomenological process by which Joseph's own experience of prophetic power 
emerged in his encounter with physical plates. In other words, there was some kind of interaction between seer, seer stone, and gold plates, comparable to Lehi learning from the Liahona. We're not told exactly how translation of the plates worked, but it's useful to compare other instances of a prophet resonating with an object and the two together producing a translation. We don't understand the mechanics, but we glimpse the possibilities. Welch, along with Joe Spencer and Grant Hardy, also sees the plates as a complication. They propose an interesting conundrum. How do we understand the Book of Mormon text when we lack access to the original? Most translations can be checked against the original to detect any distortions introduced by the translator. We can determine what was actually in the original and what was added or altered by the translation, but we can't evaluate the text of the Book of Mormon when we lack access to the original on the plates. As Welch puts it, the absence of an authoritative original text inscribed on the plates, an absence um, uh, um, I'm misplaced, misplaced. in the disappearance of the first 116 pages of the manuscript conditions the way in which the Book of Mormon can be interpreted as scripture, ruling out interpretive fundamentalism that seats a stable anchoring original text. We can't, in other words, adhere exactly to the words given to the Nephite prophets when we can't examine the original. All we have is a translated text and one that necessarily departed from the original as all translations do. Mediated social translations of the Book of Mormon, not unlike Leas Brass Paul with his continually revised divine writing, are the only text available for the interpretation. It is a matter of general hermeneutics. The absent plates recommend a mode of reading scripture, attuned to plurality, improvisation, and performativity. Some big words there. I don't understand them all myself. How much translation in gold plates text conform with one another, we cannot know. I believe it was because of these circumstances that the textual scholar Joe Spencer wrote, the, the, the plates should be left out of consideration when we approach the Book of Mormon. The task that's signed in the scripture itself is to read the Book of, of the Book of Mormon quite regardless of the plates. Under the circumstances, Spencer wrote, the plates are a distraction. We can believe with Royal Skousen that the translation Joseph received by revelation was tightly controlled. The translator spoke only what was revealed to him, but how far that revealed translation conformed to the text on the plates cannot be known. We would waste a lot of effort guessing at what Nephi wrote and when Joseph spoke. It is better, I think, Spencer is telling us, to work with the Book of Mormon as it is, there on the printed page, rather than try to guess a translation older than the original Nephi. Thinking along the same lines, a historian of both Asian culture and the Book of Mormon, Grant Hardy, elaborated the problem. Our English version cannot have been a literal translation of the Nephite record, since anachronistic phrasing from the King James Bible, as well as other elements of 19th century Christianity, indicate a rather free rendition or an updating of the ancient source. Hardy is not saying that Joseph Smith contrived the Book of Mormon himself. He tells that, uh, this is what he says on that point, I personally believe the text was revealed to Joseph Smith in a fairly exact form. Hardy is simply saying that the Book of Mormons revealed to Joseph Smith may have been expanded on the ancient writing, introducing a lot of 19th century material in order to reach a modern audience. We don't know how much of the text existed in the original and how much was added in the process of inspired translation. 
In this state of uncertainty, what is the role of the plates? Should we simply forget them? And Joe Spencer recommends in order to avoid being distracted as uh, being distracted? No, Hardy says, the plates have a critical function. The plates, assuming their ancient construction, would have been evidence to Joseph Smith, his early associates, and modern believers that there was some historical basis for the scriptural narrative he published in 1830. Savannah Echoes Johnston underscored Hardy's observation. The reality of the plates asserts the historicity of the Book of Mormon. If these gold plates are real, then the civilizations documented on the plates were real. The Book of Mormon was not purely a 19th century um, revelation. The plates created a link between modern readers and the ancient prophets. As you can see then, the solicited comments lead us into deep water. I appreciate the merit in all of them, which to sum up I've divided into five categories. One, John Peters prefers to understand the plates as an elusive creation of faith. Two, others accept the plates because they are one with Latter-day Saint belief in miraculous happenings. Yes, they're at odds with modern scientific belief, but we as people accept such things. Three, the plates are a calculated provocation. Like the resurrection of Christ, they lead us into a world of divine visitations and miraculous happening, challenging smug secular materialism. Four, the plates can be read as a parable of how a kind Heavenly Father honors the life stories of his people. Five, finally, the plates, or rather their absence, complicates our understanding of the Book of Mormon. Without them, we could never pin down how much of the text was in the original and how much translation shaped the results. We can only deal with the text as we have it. Taken together, these comments, every one of them useful, offer a complex account of the plates' meaning for Latter-day Saints today. As for my own view of the plates, after reviewing the comments of my friends, I was prompted to ask, what would we lose if we forgot the plates? What if they gradually faded from our stories, our manuals, our thoughts? We're certainly not repudiating the plates, but the fact is that they are rarely mentioned in sacrament talks or in any branch of our preaching. They are touched on only once in the missionary lessons, and then but briefly. We no longer make much of the biblical evidence from the plates, the stick of Joseph and the stick of Judah in Ezekiel 37, key elements at one time. Given our current lack of interest, would anything of value be lost if we forgot them altogether? One way to assess the plate's importance is to examine the, them against the backdrop of the Protestant Reformation. One among the many transformations that Protestantism wrought in the 16th century was to move the center of religious life from the historical to the psychological. The Catholic imagination was rooted in events headed by the birth of Christ the crucifixion, and the resurrection. Gospel events were followed by the miracles wrought by the saints and the valiant acts of the crusaders. Individuals were elevated to sainthood only if they had performed a miraculous act. Everywhere, there was vivid, miraculous action involving supernatural beings intervening in human life. For a time, every Catholic church was expected to have a relic under its altar, fragments of bone, hair, furniture, or clothing, memorializing a saint's miraculous acts. The walls and windows of Catholic churches were covered with depictions of Moses and the tablets, events in Christ's lives, miracles wrought by the saints, and the heroism of Catholic warriors. Catholics lived in a world of constant divine action. 
As the political scientist Louis Mitchley said in his statement, Roman Catholics and Eastern, North, Eastern Orthodox have been and still are much concerned to constantly remind themselves that Christian faith consists of and is also grounded in and rests upon certain crucial historical events. Protestantism changed this emphasis. Protestants were iconoclasts. They denuded the walls of their churches, erasing images of events. They dismissed accounts of saints and their miracles as purely superstition. Godly miracles were declared to have ended with Christ and were no longer needed. Post Christ, only Satan performed miracles. If an angel appeared, the evil one was behind it. Protestants gave up holy miracles. Worship came to focus on preaching and the word. What mattered to Protestantism were the dramas of the soul, faith, and the workings of the heart. Religion became increasingly psychological and intellectual. The basic events of the incarnation and the resurrection remained in Protestant history, of course, but at the heart of Protestant religion was belief and faith. Latter-day Saint religion unavoidably drew from its Protestant environment. We, too, have always emphasized the psychological, how we feel in our hearts and what we believe. Our crucial life passage is gaining a testimony which we acquire by praying and listening to the feelings God plants in our hearts. As we mature, we seek comfort from Christ, promptings to do good, and spiritual confirmation that our doctrines are true. We teach our children to listen to the Spirit. Following in the Protestant tradition, our religion is practiced today is heavily psychological, by which I mean internal, of the heart, the spirit, the mind. But while Latter-day Saint religion is deeply psychological, we also share the Catholic emphasis on the historical. Our faith is based on actual events that occurred at historical time. We do not populate the world with, with uh, either witches or saints performing miracles, but we do believe in angels visiting the earth and occasional visits to the Father and the Son. Our religion began with a series of momentous happenings, the appearance of Christ in God, Moroni in Joseph's bedroom in Anthe Hill, John the Baptist bestowing priesthood, Peter, James, and John with more priesthood. These events lay at the center of the Restoration. We are not purely psychological in our faith. We believe in actual events in time and space that inaugurated the Restoration. In fact, the historical events are central to our faith. The Book of Mormon, the priesthood, temples, were all founded on visitations from heavenly beings who came to earth. How do we hold on to the historical events of the Restoration, the appearances, the ordinations, the translations, the bestowal of ancient records? Over the past two centuries, the historical parts of religion have been the ones under the greatest pressure. A number of the commentators I have discussed tonight acknowledge the strong headwinds of secular material culture pressing against belief in historical events. The gold plates run against the grain of standard modern truth, as do all angelic and divine communications. In religion generally, the 20th century saw a deep erosion the faith in the heroic events of Judeo-Christian religion. The visions, the healings, and above all, the resurrection were spiritualized, transformed into metaphors, stripped of their historical reality. Secular pressures were too much for liberal Protestant scholars and clergy trying to live both in both the realm of historic Christianity and the modern skeptical world. For many Protestants, especially the intellectuals, faith 
in a series of literal supernatural events simply dissolved. We still in the midst, live in the midst of that ongoing struggle. How is it affecting us? Recently, a path has opened for Latter-day Saints to follow the course of liberal Protestant. Anne Taves, a highly respected scholar of American religion with deep and sympathetic interest in Mormonism, has told the story of the gold plates in a way that deals with these pressures. She writes with remarkable empathy of a Joseph Smith who truly experiences visions and has plates. He is not lying about them. He is not self-deceived, she says. The plates are real, but real like the wafer in the Eucharist. The priest and the communicants truly believe the wafer is the body of Christ. Taves believed Joseph Smith was as sincere as those priests. There were gold plates as surely as the body of Christ dwells in the wafers. She offers us a set of plates that are real for Joseph Smith and perhaps for all who believed him, just not quite historically or materially real. That is the way we would go if we were to follow the course of 20th century liberal Protestantism, hold on to the plates, but yield a little on their historicity. Is that our destiny? What are the bulwarks that we as Latter-day Saints can raise against these trends? Or perhaps more accurately, what has God provided as a defense of our historical faith? If we look to the resurrection as a precedent for the plates, as a number of the commentators did, we remember all the ways Christ assured the disciples of the living reality of his resurrection the various appearances, the conversations, the instructions after he died, the meals eaten together. We recall the response of the doubter Thomas. Christ invited him to reach hither thy finger and behold my hands and reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless but believing. To a doubter, Christ offers a touch of his wounds palpable sensory feeling. Again, in the marble, memorable scene in Third Nephi in Christ's visit to America, Jesus told the multitude to arise and come forth unto me, that ye may thrust your hands into my side, and also that ye may feel the prints of the nails in my hand and in my feet, that ye may know that I am God of Israel and the God of the whole earth and have been slain for the sins of the world. Christ, again, offers touches as the sensory basis of belief. We are not there and do not feel the wounds ourselves, but we take the reports as testimony of the reality of Christ's return from the grave. In my opinion, the gold plates are the wounds of the restoration. As John Peter said, they stand apart from other forms of witness in their billiard ball tactility. They were a thing, a heavy stack of metal sheets Joseph had to lug home from the hill. They had to be hidden under the floorboards and covered with a cloth. They were held and balanced on a knee. Moreover, witnesses saw and felt the plates. The translator of this work has shown unto us the plates of which hath been spoken, which have the appearance of gold, and as many of the leaves as said Smith has translate, we did handle with our hands, and we also saw the engravings thereon. We may not review the witnesses' statements very often or teach them in our classes, but they remain there in the front of every copy of the Book of Mormon as a tactical obstacle to disbelief. The gift of the witnesses in the publication of their statements in every Book of Mormon indicates to me that we are meant to remember the plates, to value them as evidence, much as Christ's wounds testify of the resurrection. For me, this is the meaning of the plates. They are the most durable, demanding support for the historical side of our religion. Ties primarily to one figure, 
the angel Moroni, but in leaving space for him, he opened the way for other heavenly visitors. The plates prop open the door to an ensemble of angelic beings entering ordinary life. If we give up on the plates by letting them fall into disuse, never having them in light, never discussing them, we lose the most tangible proof of divine persons entering history. We risk letting the historical side of our faith slip away. We may not dwell on the plates or always expound on them, but we certainly do not want to forget them. One final comment. I would like to make a point not mentioned by any of the commentators. I am impressed with the beauty of the plates. As described by those who saw them, there were a stack of hammered gold sheets, dusky with age, bound with gold rings, engraved with mysterious characters, telling the story of a doomed civilization that brought about its own destruction through rebellion against God. For me, that is a glorious image. Add the fact that the plates were a material witness of an angelic visitation, and we have an artifact worthy of our highest regard. In the name of Christ, amen.